What does someone actually mean when they say, I love you? If you think about it, I love you means all kinds of different things depending on the context. My two-year-old son says it to me when he's going to bed, and I think right now what he basically means is, goodbye, see you later, dad. My five-year-old son, well, he recently wrote a song about his love for his mom. Just out of the blue, he started singing this song that he had made up. And it's a song that melted her heart. It would melt any parent's heart. Over and over, he says in the song, I love you, mom, I love you, mom. But two lines in particular help to give some understanding about what is it that he means. And he says, I love you, mama, when we play. And I love you, mama, when we sing. And it's about the experience of being with mom. That's what Oliver loves. That's, that's what he's thinking about when he says, I love you, mom. When he's with mom, he feels accepted. He feels safe. He feels connected. He feels happy. It's a lot of fun to be with mom. Oliver loves that. And in that sense, Oliver loves his mom. You know, teenagers often mean something pretty similar when they tell their boyfriend or girlfriend, I love you. A lot of times it means something like, I feel really good when I'm with you and I don't want that to go away. It could be because this other person makes them feel accepted or safe or wanted and desired or because this other person makes them feel alive and excited and invigorated or just that they feel embraced by the person. But again, it's, it's often a love for the experience of being with that person. The same often goes for adults. I love you for an adult could mean I want you. It could mean I want to be with you. It could mean I need you. It could mean I'm ready to marry you. Or I love you could be something that you say as an adult because you have to. You know, like, love you too. It doesn't necessarily have to carry a lot of meaning. And that's the, what we see is that I love you is a, a pretty squishy phrase. It's so common that it's not necessarily a big deal to hear someone talk about how they love you. But love itself is different. Love itself is powerful. When we are really, truly loved by someone, their love moves us. There is no greater gift that you can receive from a human being than to be truly loved by them. I mean, think about it. Some of you rarely, if ever, hear your parents tell you, I love you. And yet you know that they love you. You have felt their love, even if they didn't talk about it that much. And their love has shaped your entire life. It's made you the person who you are today. There is a power to true love that nothing can match. True love can even forge two people into one. And this love is the very gift that God wants you to give to others here in our church community and to others in your life. He doesn't want us to give Valentines. He doesn't want us to give I love yous. He wants us to give the real deal, love itself. Love is what the three persons of the Trinity have been giving to each other since eternity past. Love is what God gives to his children. And love is what God wants his children to give to one another. In verse 11, John says, For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Today we're going to reflect on what this verse means. We're going to be unpacking what does it mean to love someone? What does love look like? What does it look like to be unloving? 
And why is it that it's so hard for us to love people even when we want to love them? These are some of the questions we're going to be wrestling with in our text this morning. But before we get into that, I think we should spend some time asking for God's help uh, to bless our time and, and to work within us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you as your children in need of your revelation, in need of new strength, new courage, in need of a new heart and a greater love. And so we ask that you'd use your word by your spirit to transform us into people who would give you more glory, into people who would be more loving, more faithful to you, and more kind to each other. We pray that uh, this word would not come to us and just bounce off of us, but would you help it to sink into our hearts and to change us? We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, we all know that we're supposed to love each other. This calling is rooted in the Old Testament. It was reiterated and then amplified and reinforced by Jesus in the Gospels. From the very beginning of our Christian journey, we have known that love is what God calls us to as Christians. But to understand what love really is, we must first understand what love is not. And that's why John starts by talking about hate, which really typifies what it looks like to be unloving. He structures this whole passage as a contrast between love and hate. So that by outlining, first of all, what love's opposite is, we might better understand what love itself is and understand how love must then work and what love must require of us. So look with me at verses 12 to 15, where we see him outlining hate as a, as a way of typifying what it looks like to, to not be loving with others. Verse 12, we should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Now, John uses Cain's life as an illustration of a life of hate. You probably already heard of Cain. We get his story in Genesis chapter 4. He is a son of Adam and Eve. And one day, Cain and his brother Abel go to offer sacrifices to God. And God refuses to accept Cain's sacrifice, even as he chooses to accept Cain's brother Abel's sacrifice. We learn in the book of Hebrews that this is because Abel offers his sacrifice in faith as an expression of his ongoing commitment to God, while we can then conclude that Cain must have just been going through the motions, and that's why God did not accept this sacrifice. It wasn't offered in faith. It was just something he did, this sacrifice. He, he offered it because he had to, not because he loved God. It's much like how some children end up going to church because their parents say that they have to go, not because they want to go and praise God. That's not a sincere act of worship. That's just going through the motions. Now, God, of course, knows exactly what's going on in our minds and in our hearts. He knew Cain's heart, and he refused to accept this kind of sacrifice that Cain was offering to him. Now, he was still gracious with Cain. He still points Cain in Genesis 4 to his great need to repent, to put his faith in God, to resist the temptation to sin, this dangerous temptation. But Cain, he doesn't listen to God because he is angry. 
He is angry at God for not accepting his sacrifice. And he is angry at his brother, God's favorite, who is so happy now that God accepted his sacrifice. And so one day, Cain goes out in the field with Abel, and he murders him. That is where hate leads, John says. Look at verse 15. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. You see, hate destroys relationships, even sibling relationships. And taken to its logical conclusion, hate leads to murder. Now, John's building off of the connection Jesus made famously in his Sermon on the Mount. He says in Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 and 22, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is, who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. God does not just judge murderers. God also judges the murderous thoughts and desires of our wicked hearts. He judges the hateful speech that those wicked hearts lead us to utter. Because hate is where murder really begins. Hate is the first step on that path. The first step is not when you make up the plan of how you're going to murder someone. You started on that path as soon as you accepted and embraced this hatred for them in your heart. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. There is no feeling more unloving than hatred and no act more unloving than murder. And yet in this world where everybody seems to embrace the idea that we should love each other, there is so much hate. John says this is what we should expect to see in our world, that this is how it's always been. Why? Because hatred is of the devil. And you know what else is of the devil, according to John? The world. Remember what John taught us last week in verse 10. There are really just two spiritual families on earth. There's God and his children, and then there's the devil and his children. Every human being belongs to one of these two spiritual families. As we saw last week, the way you figure out which family somebody belongs to is you look at how they are living their life. It's going to show their family heritage. John says in verse 10, by this, it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. Because God's children want and try to do what is right. And to some degree, they succeed in doing what is right. And because God's children want and try to love their brother, and to some degree, they succeed in that. That's the life that they're trying to, to live. On the other hand, if somebody refuses to obey God, even when they know what God commands, they say, I'm not going to do that. Or they refuse to act in love toward others. Not just that they fail to love them, but they're not going to give it up. They're not going to give up that hatred. They're acting like the devil. And this is because, though they would vehemently deny it, their actions demonstrate that they are a child of the devil. John puts Cain forward as the prototype of the devil's children here. He explicitly says in verse 12 that Cain was of the evil one, a child of the devil. That's why 
Verse 12, his deeds were evil. But John doesn't just focus on Cain's evil deeds here. He also focuses even more, more clearly, on the evil heart that led Cain into this evil. Cain had a heart of hate, not a heart of love, because he was a child of the devil. And this is ultimately true of every person in our world today who is not a child of God. Every member of what John calls the world is a child of the devil. The world hates because their spiritual father hates. To put it another way, hate is the way of the world because the world is of the devil and hate is the way of the devil. But what does John mean here by hate? It's a key question. Because if we misunderstand what John means by hate here, we might assume that what the world does is therefore all bad and what Christians do is all good. But we know from experience that this really is not the case. There are plenty of moral non-Christians and there are plenty of Christians who sin. Moreover, John is calling out hate here, not to make these Christians feel superior to the world, but so that they might look for this kind of worldly hatred in their own heart, and then reflect on the ways that this kind of worldly sinful hatred is driving them to sin against others. So what is the way of hate that Cain walked? How did it work? How did he get to the point where he actually murdered his brother? The clearest picture we get, I think, in all of the Bible of how sinful hatred plays out in terms of the dynamics of our heart and in our lives is in James chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. I want to turn there for a minute, if you wouldn't mind. James chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. James says this, What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this? that your passions are at war within you. You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. Hate and murder they start with something that seems so innocent. I desire. I want. It seems like that's, well, why is that a big deal to desire and to want? Well, to start, you're, once you're already thinking, okay, this is what I desire. You're thinking about your desires. Your focus has already turned onto yourself. You are thinking about you, specifically, about what you want, what would be good for you. You have this craving, this urge within you, this yearning for something. It could be anything. James calls that a passion. And he says these passions in our hearts, they are the little trickles of snow that start rolling down the mountain to create an avalanche of destruction. You don't just have desires. Your desires have you. Your desires war within you. They strive to take over your whole life. Cain did not just prefer that God accept his sacrifice. God's acceptance was important to him. He craved God's acceptance of his sacrifice. He sought it. He wanted to feel like he was a good person or at least equal to his brother, but this made him feel inferior and he hated that because he needed to have this identity of being a good person affirmed. He had to have God's acceptance. Had to. That's what happens with our passions. I want that soon turns into, I need that. We really feel like 
the thing that we crave, we, we need it. And that's when we start to become dangerous to other people. Because once you're convinced that something needs to happen, that someone needs to like you, that someone needs to respect you, that someone needs to give you their approval or their money or anything, once your passions turn from I want that to I need that, well then you could potentially try to justify almost anything to yourself because now it's a matter of need. It's a need, so you feel like you should pursue it. And this gives you this feeling of self-righteousness as you, as you pursue it. Like, like you are in the right, that you are doing what needs to be done. You're a good person. You're, you need to you know, take care of your needs, right? Think of the athletes who you hear about in the headlines who are holding out for even more millions of dollars. You know, they're getting offered tens of millions of dollars, but they're trying to hold out for eight million more. And they say, I need to take care of my family. You know, they feel like they're doing something good. They feel like, you know, hey, I'm trying to take care of my family. And yet at a deeper level, what may actually be driving them is a sinful craving for money. And they might not even see it. It's easy to be deceived about our true motivations for pursuing something. We're so good at lying to ourselves. And so once this need is there in our mind, once this desire turns into a need, the other thing that tends to happen to us is, is we feel like, okay, it's a need, so I have no choice but to pursue that thing. We start to live under this illusion that we don't have agency in this particular situation, that this is just who we are, that this is just what we need. So we have no choice but to pursue it. Which then, of course, makes us, it sort of lets us off the hook, right? Because if we don't have a choice, then how can we be made accountable for making the wrong choice? So these are the, the two lies that help us live for our cravings and live a craving-centered life. These two lies. One, I have no choice. I need this. Two, I'm doing the right thing. I'm meeting my family's needs, I'm meeting people's needs, I'm doing good. These are the lies that we use to justify a craving-driven, want-driven life. Whatever that craving is for you, money, approval, power, safety, control over your surroundings, pleasure, status, anything. In that moment, what you do is you justify it to yourself that this is a, not just something that you want, but this is something that you need. And therefore you need to pursue it. You have to, you have no choice. And indeed it's good that you pursue it because you should be meeting needs, especially when you're meeting the needs of other people. But often it's just your own needs that you feel like you need to satisfy, especially in American culture nowadays. Everybody talks about your need to meet your own needs. Self-love can easily masquerade as true love. Now, what happens then when a person like this looks over and they see someone next to them who has the thing that they need? Well, they think, oh, I need that. And if it weren't for that person, I could have that. They're more popular than I am. But if I could get them out of the picture, then I would be more popular. I would move up a rung on the social ladder in my school. They have lots of power. But if they were out of the picture, I and my people could have lots of power. They are father's favorite. But if they were out of the picture, I would be the favorite. And soon I need becomes I can't get what I want because you are in my way. As James puts it, you covet and cannot obtain because this other person is standing in your way. They won't let you obtain what you are coveting. So then what happens? 
You get angry. And you start to scheme about how you can get them out of the picture so you can get what you need. And that is hatred. You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. Fighting, quarreling, murdering, these are strategies that people use to try to get someone out of the picture so that in their mind they can get their needs met or have their families or their people's needs met. Even wicked hatred for other people can easily masquerade as a righteous love for your people or your family. You just say, well, I'm just trying to take care of my people, get what we need. That's what we tell ourselves. And we do it to justify all kinds of things that are far from love. And once you get angry with this person, getting in your way, you get angry with them. There's really two sets of options available to you. Both of these express hatred in a way. And it's basically fight or flight. Usually it's fight when you're full of anger. You try to dominate them. You try to seize what they have. Take it by force. That's an expression of hate. Murder is the most obvious example of this effort to dominate someone else. But you might also try to slander them or silence them or try to take them down in some other way, fight with them. But if fighting isn't gonna get them out of the picture, then you may decide that you may just need to leave the picture. And so what do you do? You, you flee. You withdraw from them. You cut off the relationship. You run away. You move away. You get a new job. You find another church. You find another friend group. Because you have needs, right? And your needs aren't being met. But this too can be an expression of hatred for the people you're leaving behind, for the relationships you're cutting off. Because what you're really saying is what I want is more valuable to me than you are. You can make that message clear by quarreling with someone. You can make it clear by running away from someone to make them hurt and make your life better. But both of these strategies ultimately destroy relationships. They ultimately bring pain into other people's lives. And that is exactly the kind of thing that the devil loves to do. Destroy relationships, destroy people, bring pain and suffering. This is the way of hate that characterizes the world. It is self-love masquerading as meeting your own needs. It is the hatred of others masquerading as love for your own people. It is evil being construed as righteousness. It is the way of the devil, which we can so easily construe as the way of Christ. But this is not the way of Christ. The road Christ took was the road of true, real, powerful love. That's the road we must walk. Turn back now to 1 John, back to our passage, chapter 3. Take a look at what John says in verse 16. By this we know love that he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. The cross defines true love. John says we have come to know what love truly is because we have come to understand the cross. We understand that Jesus actually was laying down his life for us on that cross. That he was making the ultimate sacrifice willingly so that we could flourish. That is true love. That is the way of Christ. 
I love how C.H. Dodd puts it. He says, love is the willingness to surrender that which has value for our own life to enrich the life of another. Love is the willingness to surrender that which has value for our own life to enrich the life of another. Is that not the cross in a sentence? What has more value than your own life? And yet Christ voluntarily surrenders his life. Why? To enrich our lives, to bring us the wonderful blessing of salvation. That's love. That is precisely the standard of love that Jesus calls us to. Jesus doesn't lower the bar for his followers. He says in John chapter 13, verse 34, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. That commandment that John heard that day, that John wrote down in his gospel that he's been trying to live out in his life, that is the reason why he can say in verse 16 that we should lay down our lives for our spiritual brothers and sisters in Christ as an act of love, just as Christ laid down his life for his spiritual brothers and sisters. Now, few of us will ever be in that exact situation where we could actually save people by giving our life in their place. But that's okay. Because true love is not simply the cross. True love is really the heart behind the cross. The cross is an expression of that love. True love shows in our willingness to surrender anything which has value for our own life to enrich the life of another. We have countless opportunities to love others like that. John mentions one example here in the verses that follow in verses 17 and 18. What does it look like to lay down your life as a Christian for your brothers and sisters in Christ? He says, but if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, Let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. When we see a fellow Christian in need, the love of Christ requires us to surrender what we can, even when it's valuable to us, so that we can meet their need in a way that will enrich their life and help them to flourish. Love is not simply feeling pity for that brother in need. Love is not just encouraging that brother that God is going to meet their needs. Those are good things. But they are not all that love demands of you in that situation. If you have resources in that situation that you could sacrifice to help meet what is for that brother a very real need that they have, then love calls you to make a real sacrifice that will enrich their life. John is emphatic in verse 18. Let us not love in word or talk. Talk is cheap. Let us love in deed and in truth. And John's not giving us two options there, but one. He's not saying you can love them by taking actions or you can love them by sharing truth. That's not what he's saying. Loving in truth here means loving in accordance with love's true nature, truly loving. Love in a way that is active, love in a way that is true. Because love is not just an emotional attachment to someone. Love is active. It leads to deeds. Love takes the initiative. Love doesn't just pray that someone would meet that person meet person's needs. Love meets their needs where it can. True love acts sacrificially so that others might be blessed. 
We must be willing to surrender our treasures for the good of others. And I don't just mean money. Money is certainly part of it. If a Christian brother or sister is in financial need in your church, you should help them out. That's what John is saying here. Don't just pray for the person in financial need. Give them some money. As long as you have some money to give. Surrender some of your riches so that their life might be enriched. But the, the principle of love really needs to steward how we relate to all of our resources, not just money, but also time and our energy and our, our focus and attention. Those are scarce and valuable resources, and those too need to be used in the service of love. People have all kinds of needs. Someone might have social needs. Maybe they need somebody to talk to because they're old and, and shut in and they don't have, you know, they can't get out or they're living in a global pandemic and they can't see people. Love would call us to call the socially needy in our church or text them or write them a letter or do something to help meet this need to be connected to other people so that we can enrich their life. Another person might have emotional needs. They really need someone to encourage them. They're really going through a hard time. How could you help them get through that time of suffering? How could you help carry their burdens? Even if that was going to take some time and energy on your part. Someone else might have physical needs. They need moving help. They need a ride. They need someone to fix their car. How could you use your strength, your energy, and your talents to serve them, to enrich, enrich their life? This is how love plays itself out in everyday life. That's just what it looks like. This is what the church should look like. It's not about just making one grand gesture of self-sacrifice. It's about making ordinary sacrifices with the resources that God has given to you in your life so that you can help meet the needs of others in a way that enriches their life and in this way gives glory to Christ by imitating him. That's what true love looks like in real life. If you live your life like that, if you don't just talk the talk of love, but you walk the walk of true love and you put other people's needs ahead of your own needs, it shows that you really are a Christian. It's evidence of, of real faith. It shows, John says in verse 14, that you have gone from spiritual death to spiritual life. That you are not a child of the devil but a child of God, which is why you are loving others like your father does. The contrast couldn't be more clear in this passage. The church should be nothing like the world. In the world, people are walking in the way of Cain. In the world, it's everyone for themselves. Everyone is looking out for their own interests, trying to get what they want in life. It's, I want, no, I need that. And I'm sorry, but you are in my way. And you either need to give it to me or you need to get out of my way. And if you don't get out of my way, I'm going to get you out of my way. I'm going to take you out of the picture. The way of the world is a way of anger and hatred, which puts self before others and things before people. And this angry hatred makes the world a place of violence and fighting as everybody is trying to dominate everybody else. And it makes it a place of alienation as people withdraw from relationships that they can't control, relationships that are not satisfying to them, leaving behind divorces and broken relationships with children and estranged friends, all kinds of brokenness. But in the church, it should be the opposite. Christians are called to walk in the way of Christ, in the way of love. Because we trust that Christ has provided and will provide for us, we can focus not on meeting our own needs, but on meeting the needs of others. In Christ, in the church, it's no longer, or it should not be, I need so I take anymore. It should be, you need, so I give. 
The Christian lives for others, not for themselves. First of all, they live for God. But in their way of living for God, they live for others like God does. And so for the Christian, others are not obstacles to be removed in their life. Others are the loved ones that we want to help. We don't hate them. We serve them. We don't destroy their life to enrich our own life. We give our life to enrich their life. Because when we deserved to be destroyed by Jesus because of our sin, he didn't destroy us. He loved us instead. He gave his life for us. And so now we must give our lives for others, no matter how worthy or unworthy they may seem to us. Because talk is not enough. Agreeing that we should love is not enough. Feeling warm feelings for somebody is not enough. We cannot just love in word and talk. We must love through deeds of love. For as Christ showed us, this is what true love does. And if you're a Christian, you will want to live like that. And if you're a Christian, you can live like that. Because God has brought you from spiritual death to spiritual life. But love is still not going to be easy. Love is never the easy way. Because love costs us. And we don't like to pay for things. We go to great lengths to get out of paying for something, don't we? It's because we really value our money. And this makes it hard for us to give it up. So when you see that person on the street asking for money, you go to great lengths to avoid them. When someone starts going on and on about their problems, you, look, you go to great lengths looking for any way you can get out of that conversation with them. When someone asks you to help them with their move, you desperately try to locate an excuse for why you can't help that day. Why? Honestly, it's because in that moment, you and I value our time, our money, and our comfort more than we value that person who is in need. That's why. It's worldliness. It's a version of hatred. It is unloving. It is Cain-like. Cain opened his heart to his own sinful desires, and this led him to close his heart off to his brother. So to obey Christ's command and to love our brother, we must do the opposite. To open our heart toward others, we must close it off inside. We must close our heart off to our sinful desires. It's only by saying no to the demands of self that we can say yes to Christ's demand that we love our brothers. If you have a hard time loving others, it's because you have a heart problem. The valve that's supposed to be closed is open and the valve that's supposed to be open is closed. You've let your passions loose and they are leading you to put others to death. It is only by putting your passions to death and saying no to your own selfishness by the power of God that you can grow to help others live and to flourish. The way of the world is to enrich your own life even at the expense of others. The way of Christ is to enrich the lives of others even at the expense of your own life. Let's pray that God would help us do that very thing as his people. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would so transform us that we would live out this kind of life of love that we see exemplified in Christ. This kind of life of love that he paid the price so that we could live. We pray that you would help us love others in the way 
that we will one day love them when all of these passions have been put to death by Jesus, where there is no more sin in our life and we can truly be people who reflect Christ as we love you and we love others. Would you put to death these sinful passions within us, all of these desires that we have to just live for ourselves and focus on ourselves? And would you open our hearts to others so that when we see their needs, we would not think that neediness that you have is in my way and I would rather be over here. But we think that neediness over there, that neediness that you have, that's something I want to help you with. I want to serve you. I want to, I want to help you grow and flourish. Father, would you give us generous hearts? Would you give us hearts that are not just focused on our own life and what we want to do, but just the hearts that are, are all about you, what you want us to be, what you are doing. Hearts that lead us to, to have our eyes open to the needs of others and lead us to actually take action, not just have good intentions, but actually act in love toward people, especially people in need. So we pray that you'd open our eyes to those needs that you would have us meet and that you would grow this love for you and for others within us so that your love might knit us together in our church as brothers and sisters into one tight-knit spiritual family that brings you glory as we don't withdraw but come together as we don't dominate each other but serve one another in love. Would you help us do that? For your glory's sake and for our good, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.